Welcome to the Radiant Visalia podcast. Join us at one of our two services, 9 a.m. and 1045 a.m. Download the Church Center app or visit our website, radiantvisalia.com, to stay connected with us. All right, enjoy. so much Travis morning everyone you have had an impact on us and I'm not saying that to flatter you that is true Um, we visited you up here we've spent some time in Travis and Tiffany's home with their beautiful daughters they were with us with our three this last weekend and your joy and your courage your innovation your love for this city and for your region has impacted us greatly. Um, please excuse my accent or bear with it. As my friends say, it makes me sound smarter than I really am. I'm from South Africa. We've lived here uh, for going on eight years. And uh, Travis has asked me to um, join you in your ACT series, um, uh, which, which has been about the mission of God, and I know that you've jumped around Acts, so I'm going to read from Acts 10, and we're going to talk about the mission of God and the nations, and I guess, I, I suppose, pretty appropriate that someone who's from beyond this nation, uh, who calls this nation home, and yet grew up in South Africa, um, would, would speak on that. But uh, it's, it's more than just coming to live in in another nation, we really do carry the nations in our hearts. And, um, you know, when I was in my mother's tummy, um, she she actually, I'm a a big boy, I was a big baby, maybe I'm still a big baby, Um, but she nearly bled to death over me. And uh, God sustained her with, with a dream that she took 17 years to tell me about. She waited until I was 17, but uh, she had a dream when she was pregnant with me that uh, the baby in your stomach would uh, be a preacher that travels the world with a guitar. And when she told me that as a 17-year-old, something leapt in my heart, and um, it's really been part of our our life. Uh, We got married when we were 21 and began traveling with a guitar and preaching and really have never stopped. And, and because of that, uh, we've really begun to dig into the Scriptures in terms of what does it mean to be a people who love our neighborhood, because we're called to love our neighbors, but a people who love the nations. What does it mean as the church to win both home games and away games? And it seems like over your 10 years, you've really won many home games, and so great to be with you around your 10-year anniversary celebrating all that God has done. And yet, as I speak to the leaders, there seems to be a leaning forward to say, we don't want to stop winning home games, do we? But we are called to regions beyond. And what does that look like for the people of God? So turn with me to Acts chapter 10, the mission of God and the nations. And uh, we're going to pick up in um, verse 23. It's quite a long chapter, but uh, it begins with Peter. Peter the Apostle, Peter one of the founders of the early church, Peter who lived with his foot in his mouth, Peter who was always over-promising and under-delivering, Peter is a great, great encouragement to me. He seemed to take three steps forward and then two steps backwards. There was progress and regress, and yet God, Jesus in His grace, chose to put His hand on Peter to forgive him. He denied him three times. Jesus reinstated him three times, said, You are Peter, on this rock I will build my church. He was a key founding father of the local church. But I tell you what, what I love about Peter more than anything is that he does not self-edit his faux pas. He does not self-edit his worst points. In the Gospel of Mark, which is Peter's eyewitness accounts, in Acts 10, which was Luke's eyewitness accounts, and then in Peter's own letters, he doesn't just include his best moments, he includes his worst moments. Isn't that encouraging? I don't know about you, but I love Instagram, and and in Instagram, you're putting forward the best version of yourself to the world, right? We'll take three or four photos, and then 
choose the one that shows our jawline best, our best side, and we'll put the crema filter on there (laughs) because we want the world to have the best version of ourselves. Peter was not like that. And Acts 10 is glorious because it was Peter actually as, as a hero crossing borderlines from Jew to Gentile. This was the birth of the Gentile church. And yet it was Peter, a very flawed hero, because he resists three times, just like he denied Jesus three times, he resists three times before he obeys. Who does it remind you of? Reminds me of me. Don't know about you. And so there's this Roman centurion, a Gentile, called Cornelius. And he's a God-fearing man. He prays often. Uh, he's, He's discovered Israel's God, Yahweh, and he gives to the poor, he's respected, he's got integrity, and one day he's praying, and an angel appears to him and says, Cornelius, your prayers and your gifts to the poor have risen as incense to heaven. Isn't it amazing to think that, that people who are not Christians, heaven still sees their lives, sees their good works, and an angel comes and says, send to Joppa, 30 minutes away, sorry, 30 miles away. And there's a man called Peter staying at Simon the Tanner's house and send for him and he will tell you what to do. At the same time as this angel appears to the the Roman centurion Cornelius, Peter is praying on a rooftop, Simon the Tanner's house, overlooking the sea, and there's a vision. And in the vision, there's the sheet that is let down from heaven. And all these unclean foods for Jewish people, all the foods that I like, actually, you know, a bacon breakfast and lobster thermidor and shrimp ceviche and baby back ribs, it's, it's all those off-limits foods for Jewish people are let down. And Peter is, is scandalized by these. But there's a voice from heaven that says, arise, Peter, kill and eat. God is not a vegetarian. Kill and eat. And, and Peter resists three times. No, surely not. No, surely not. And God just persists. And then eventually, Peter gets it. And as he is resisting, there's a knock at the door. And Cornelius' two servants arrive at the door. And he realizes these are Gentiles. And he makes the connection between unclean food and unclean people. And he concludes, I must go with these people. It wasn't just about having shrimp ceviche. Actually, those unclean animals eaten by Gentiles were what made the Gentiles unclean. And so Peter concludes, oh, okay, God, I get your point. And he goes with them. And we're going to pick up from there, verse 23. You tracking with me? Good. I'm not Pentecostal, but I love a bit of Pentecostal. Amen. So feel free. So he arrives, walks 30 miles to Joppa, and Simon invited them in to be his guests. The next day he rose and went away with them, and some of the brothers from Joppa accompanied him, and on the following day they entered Caesarea. Cornelius was expecting them and had called together his relatives and close friends. When Peter entered, Cornelius met him and fell down at his feet and worshipped him. But Peter lifted him up, saying, Stand up, I too am a man." And as he talked with him, he went in and found many persons gathered, and he said to them, you yourselves know how unlawful it is for a Jew to associate with or to visit any of another nation. But God has shown me that I should not call any person common or unclean. So when I was sent for, I came without objection. That's not altogether true, is it? He actually objected three times. (laughs) I came without objection. I came straight away. Not true. And I ask then, why have you sent for me? And Cornelius said, four days ago, about this hour, I was praying in my house at the ninth hour. And behold, a man stood before me in bright clothing and said, Cornelius, your prayer has been heard and your arms have been remembered before God. Send therefore to Joppa and ask for Simon, who is called Peter. He is lodging in the house of Simon, a tanner by the sea. So I sent for you at once, and you have been kind enough to come. Now, therefore, we are all here in the presence of God to hear all that you have been commanded by the Lord. So Peter opened his mouth and said, Truly, I understand that God knows, shows no partiality or no favoritism. 
But in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. As for the word that he sent to Israel, preaching good news of peace through Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. You yourselves know what happened throughout all Judea, beginning from Galilee after the baptism that John proclaimed, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. He went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. And we are witnesses of all that he did, both in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They put him to death by hanging him on a tree, but God raised him on the third day and made him to appear, not to all the people, but to us who had been chosen by God as witnesses, who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. And he commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one appointed by God to to be judge of the living and the dead, to him All the prophets bear witness that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. While Peter was still saying these things, the Holy Spirit fell on all who heard the word. And the believers from among the circumcised who had come with Peter were amazed because the gift of the Holy Spirit was poured out even on the Gentiles. For they were hearing them speaking in tongues and extolling God. Then Peter declared, can anyone... Withhold water for baptizing these people who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have. And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they asked him to remain for some days. Beautiful passage. In some ways, we should probably read this passage standing. Because this was the birthday of the Gentile church. This was the day on which the gospel crossed the borderlines from Jew to Gentile. The, the, the lunch got out of the lunchbox. And Jesus' intentions in Acts 1, as you would have read, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. It was beginning to be fulfilled. It's a beautiful thing. This is the day when the gospel began to come to you and I. The Gentiles. Essentially, I want to ask today, in a spirit of celebration, thank you, Lord, that the gospel came to us who were not part of God's covenant people. Thank you, Lord. And yet I want to ask, in a spirit of celebration, I want to ask, why did it take so long? Why did it seem so slow? Why did it take from Acts 1 all the way to Acts 8 for the gospel to get beyond Jerusalem? When it was clear, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts was supposed to be all simultaneous. Why did it take Stephen, the first Christian martyr, being stoned, and Saul persecuting the church for actually Christians to be scattered and go? What has been the resistance to the, to the mission of God? Why has the lunch stayed in the lunchbox? Why, why has the cheese stayed in that red wax wrapper? In Acts 8, you see after the, the, the scattering and the persecution, there's, there's a Samaritan revival. The Samaritans were seen as, as half-breeds. They, they weren't full Gentiles. They weren't fully Jewish. They, they were kind of half They were looked down on by the Jews, but actually in the scattering, there's the Samaritan revival, and you go, ah, it's happening. For the church, it wouldn't have felt good, but Jesus is saying, ah, it's happening. From Jerusalem to to Judea to Samaria. And now, Acts 10, you see the first borderline crossed to the nations, the Gentiles. And I don't just want to ask, why did it take so long with the early church? I want to ask, why does it tend to take so long with us? Why does the gospel, that is the power of God to salvation, where Paul says, all over the world, this gospel is growing and bearing fruit. There's nothing wrong with the gospel, friends. But why does it seem to move more slowly than than Jesus intends? That's my question. And I want to suggest three reasons. And I need, need you to stay with me because there's a little bit of a concept here. There's, there's three reasons we see here that cause 
in some ways, the speed bumps to crop up, the hurdles to crop up in the highway of the gospel to the nations that I think crop up in our own hearts. I think we've got borderlines in our own hearts. I don't think it's just about stamping your passport and getting on a plane and packing your bag. I think there's some borderlines in our own hearts that were in the heart of Cornelius and Peter. And all three of them are words that end with ism. Can you say ism with me? Now, an ism is a really important word because an ism takes something that is good and makes it ultimate. Let me give you an example. You people are a very communal people. To be communal is good, right? This is not a trick question. It's good, right? It's, it's, it's to do life together. Dining room table Christianity. To share. To be in each other's homes. You, you, you guys ooze community. If you put an ism on the end of community, it becomes... And you go, ah, it went from something good to something bad, right? Communism is when, is when there's no such thing as the individual. It's all just about the whole. And you just go, well, we've seen that movie before. That's not good. An ism is when a good thing becomes an ultimate thing, and then it becomes an idol. It becomes more important than Jesus himself. There's another example of that. We understand that, that we need food, shelter, clothes, gas in our tank, cars, to, to live here in California. We need material things. But materialism, we know, that, that's just when you live for your next shiny toy. And we know how easy material goods turn into materialism, right? There are three isms in here. And I need you to get this, con this, this, this concept, otherwise you're going to throw stones at me. You're going to think I'm talking against morality because the first ism that is actually a speed bump for the gospel going to the nations is moralism. Now, there's nothing wrong with morality, is there? I mean, we want good morals. There's nothing wrong. There's actually everything right with people being good citizens, staying within the laws of the country, living in the fear of God, giving to the poor, Sticking together in marriage, raising up good kids, right? But what we see is the first speed bump to the gospel going to the nations is actually in Cornelius' heart. And it is moralism. The angel appears to Cornelius and says, Cornelius, your good works, to the, your gifts to the poor and your prayers have risen as an incense offering to heaven, he is affirming Cornelius' morals. But then he says this, send to Joppa for a man called Peter. What is Peter going to do? What is Peter going to say? He's not going to come and pat Cornelius on the back and say, you good, good Gentile. Let me tell you this. As far as Gentiles go, Cornelius, he was a, he was a, a commander in the army. Good to the poor, upright, praying. Fearing Israel's God. I would like him in my church. He would, be, he would be the biggest giver. He would be at the door. You know, he, he would be on the ops team. He would be out at the homeless shelter. He, he would be an incredible member. But what does the angel come? And so the angel says, Your morals are good, but send to Peter. What is Peter's message? Repent. Repent and believe in Jesus who will wash away your sins. You see, my friends, so easily good morals become moralism, creeps into our heart. And we start to feel like actually we're good enough. And that is the first speed bump to the gospel. It's not actually about the messengers, it's about the hearers. And I've found often in churches, when I travel around to, to, to churches, and even in our church that we lead, there are many God-fearers who have not understood the grace of God. Good morals have turned into moralism. There's a book by C.S. Lewis. Any of you read C.S. Lewis? He's a, just a great British writer, and he, and, and he writes a book called The Great Divorce, which is the difference between people who go to heaven and go to hell. 
and it's an allegory. It's not theology, but, but there's two characters, and one is called the bright man, and the other is called the ghost man. And they're traveling on this bus towards their eternal destination, and the bright man who is on his way to heaven is trying to get the ghost man who's on his way to hell to actually recognize, change your destination, you can. I just want to read a quick excerpt because this illustrates moralism, the problem with moralism in our lives. Look at me now, said the ghost, slapping his chest, but the slap made no noise. I gone straight all my life. I don't say I was a religious man. I don't say I had no faults. Far from it. I done my best all my life, see? I done my best by everyone. That's the sort of chap I was. I never asked for anything that wasn't mine by rights. If I wanted a drink, I paid for it. And if I took my wages, I'd done my job, see? That's the sort I was, and I don't care who knows it. And the bright man says, it would be much better not to go on about that now. Who's going on? I'm not arguing. I'm just telling you the sort of chap I was, see? I'm asking for nothing but my rights. You may think you can put me down because you dressed up like that. And I'm only a poor man, but i got to have my rights, the same as you, see? The bright man says, oh no, it's not so bad as that. I haven't got my rights, or I should not be here, and you will not get yours either. You'll get something far better, never fear. Ghost man says, that's just what I say, I haven't got my rights, I've always done my best, and i never done nothing wrong. And what I don't see is why I should be put below a bloody murderer like you. Bright man says, who knows whether you will be? Only be happy and come with me. Ghost man says, what do you keep on arguing for? I'm only telling you the sort of chap I am. I only want my rights. I'm not asking for anybody's bleeding charity. And the bright man says, then do at once. Ask for the bleeding charity. Everything is here for the asking and nothing can be bought. Ask for the bleeding charity charity. See, Cornelius was a good, moral, God-fearing man, but he could have so easily slipped into moralism. And essentially, Peter was saying, and the angel was saying, Cornelius, ask for the bleeding charity. I talked to a man last week, six foot six, tattered block of granite, and he came to Easter to watch his son being baptized, and his son was kind of a mini-me. Uh, he, he was also pretty big, not quite as big as his dad, and I only just got him into the baptismal font because of his shoulder width. And I met the dad, his name was Chad, and the next week he came back to church. And after the nine, he came up to me and he shook my hand and he said, my name's Chad, do you, remem- re- do you remember me? I was here when my son Anthony got baptized. I said, yeah, I remember you, Chad. And he said, I'd like to give my life to Jesus. So I asked him a few questions, and we prayed, a prayer of faith and repentance. And the week after, I had coffee with him. I said, what happened? What what caused you to cross the line of faith? What was going on? He said, I was sitting at the back next to a little Asian lady listening to you, and it suddenly made sense. He said, you know what? I've had a lot of time to read the Bible. I've done time. I said, oh, you have? He says, yeah, I've done time. I've got a lot to be forgiven for. And the lady tapped me on the shoulder and said, Sir, do you know that Jesus can forgive you? And I responded to her, but I just need to clean up my life. And the little Asian lady next to me said, No, 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 that's not the way it works. You give your life to Jesus and he will clean you up. And he said, That's what gave me courage to give my life to Jesus. Cornelius asked for the bleeding charity. Chad asked for the bleeding charity. There's some of you here that need to ask for the bleeding charity. Don't let the speed bump of moralism stop the gospel from getting into your heart. And then the second two, second two obstacles to the gospel getting to the nations are actually in not the hearers but the senders in Peter. Peter was actually a bigger problem than Cornelius. And it's an amazing theme in Scripture. If you look in the book of Jonah, Jonah is running from the call of God. Once he eventually obeys, Nineveh gets saved, the whole city, in three days. It echoes Jesus when he says, look, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. 
it seems like Jesus has a bigger problem in getting the gospel to the nations with the church than the world. I think so often we go, oh, the world out there, they're so hard-hearted, they don't want to know the gospel. Actually, it seems like Jesus has a bigger problem with us than them. And so there are these two speed bumps in Peter's heart. And the first is favoritism. It's the main theme of this book, favoritism. Now, favoritism is, is a polite way of saying that you've got pride in yourself and you've got prejudice towards someone else. He had Jewish pride and Gentile prejudice. And it stemmed from these biblical laws about eating, about food. He literally saw them as unclean. And that's why he just resisted three times. I'm not going to a Gentile's house. I'm not eating that unclean shrimp ceviche. And I'm certainly not going to sit at a table with people that eat bacon. My, my friends, it's very easy to kind of, kind of laugh and say, ah, oh, these Jews, they were so proud and so prejudiced. But, but here's the deal. This is the big idea. You and I, each of us, have our own pride and prejudice, don't we? There is a people group in this city that you feel better than. And sometimes it's around race. Sometimes it's around faith. Sometimes it's around class. Sometimes it's around gender. Sometimes it's around whether you have a degree or not, whether you white collar or blue collar. Sometimes it's a generational thing, kind of hipsters and boomers. And yet, the Bible says in Galatians 3, in Christ there is neither Greek nor Jew, male nor female, slave nor free. Sometimes it's political. Sometimes it's Republican, Democrat. Actually, if we, if, we, if we take that ethic further, that in the gospel, the dividing line was broken between Jew and Gentile. It was also broken between male and female. It was also broken between slave and free class. In our day, can the wall, the obstacle, be broken between giant and dodger? Between hipster and boomer. Between white and Latino. Between male and female. Because that is the biggest speed bump to the gospel getting to the nations. It's not necessarily getting on a plane and going to another nation. Actually, the nations are here. One of the first and wisest pieces of counsel I had when we arrived in Southern California, but it applies to California, I think, is, look, this place is not a melting pot. It's a TV dinner. Everyone sticks to their own. And you see, favoritism is so subtle, isn't it? It's not necessarily, I hate you. It's not as strong as racism, is it? It's just, I'd rather stick with my own. You can stick with your own. It's just that subtle pride and prejudice. My first trip to the USA was in 1990. I was 17 years old, and I was part of a team in the middle of apartheid South Africa that was traveling around doing music and drama, talking about the gospel of reconciliation, breaking down walls between people of different colors. So we traveled with a team that had white, that had black South African, that had Indian, and that had what we call mixed. And the problem with South Africa was that it was not just a race thing, it was a kind of a caste system. It was kind of white at the top, and then Indian, and then mixed, and then black South African. It was, it was horrendous. And we were traveling around, we went all around Africa, it was so successful that five cities in America said, can you come here? And you know what was the first one? The very first American city I visited, do you know what it was? Fresno. <laughs> yes. The very first American t-shirt I got was a Fresno Bulldogs t-shirt. It was awesome. And we ministered at a great church called Grace Bible Church, and um, it was amazing. And we were traveling from Fresno 
to San Francisco talking about the, the gospel of reconciliation that would break down dividing walls between races. And there were two ladies on the team. You're going to hate me for this because actually I just started dating my wife. And one lady was a black South African and the other lady was mixed. And we were traveling and we were in a cramped bus. And so actually people were kind of cramming and sitting on laps, etc. And the lady who was the black South African came to me and, he, and said, do you mind if I sit on your lap? And I said, no. And I used the excuse of, you know, I've got a girlfriend and that would look terrible. And so she went and sat at the back of the bus. Half an hour later, the mixed race lady came and said, can I sit on your lap? And I said, yes. And when the lady at the back of the bus saw that, she laid into me and said, what are you doing? We are talking about the gospel of reconciliation, you hypocrite. My, my heart broke. My heart broke. And, and, and for me, as I've looked at Peter and Cornelius, it's so easy to point fingers, but you actually have to go, there's a little bit of that in each one of us. And our ability to realize that the gospel of reconciliation does not just reconcile enemies to God vertically. It reconciles enemies to one another horizontally. And our ability to cross the borderlines in our heart to someone that we have pride and prejudice to is a key, absolute key to the gospel going to the nations. And then finally, there's a third ism. And it's, it's the ism of conservatism. The door of the gospel hangs on the hinges of hospitality. requires opening your door, opening your fridge to someone who you are not like and you do not like. That's what happened here. Peter didn't just go with a message. He, he, he went and enjoyed a meal. He stayed with them for days. I want to land by looking at Peter's conservatism. And this, this repeated phrase, surely not, Lord. Surely not. I love it because it's such Christianese, isn't it? I mean, you cannot say in the same sentence, no and Lord. Right? You can't. You've either got to say, well, Jesus isn't Lord. He's just my kind of holy ATM machine, so I'll just say no. No, my friend. Or otherwise, if you call him Lord, you've got to say yes, right? right? Peter gets around that beautifully. He doesn't say no. He just says, surely not. Surely not. You know, one of the, one of the ways that we resist the call of God is, is just with an appeal to, to reasonable Christianity. Surely not, Lord. Lord, I've been, I've been walking with you for, for ages, and, and you know, I, I mean, I mean I've, I've got responsibilities, and, and that's just irresponsible what you're calling me to. So, Lord, here I am. Send Ryan. You know what I'm saying? Don't, don't send me because, because, because Ryan is young and, 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 and radical and, and zealous, and, and surely not, Lord. It's conservatism, my friends. Now, the root of the word conservatism is conservative, which is actually a great word. The word conservative is to conserve truth. It's wonderful. But we know, especially those of us that are getting older, I, I include myself, I'm 43, conservative so easily changes into conservatism, where anything that is out of the norm, anything that is just not what we've always done, we just go, surely not, Lord. Lord, surely not that neighbor across the street. Surely. Lord, surely not that mission trip to, to Mexico. Surely not. Surely that's for someone younger and far more radical. Do you know what cures us of conservatism, my friends? What, cons what cures us of conservatism is predestination. A big, beautiful word. 
but this idea that God is the already previous God, that He has been here before. Do you know that at the heart of our salvation is predestination, that you did not choose Him, He chose you. That you are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works that He has prepared in advance for you to walk in. Isn't it beautiful that, that before we reached out to Jesus, He was reaching out to us? Isn't it amazing that the same creativity poured into us being born was poured into us being born again? And then the same creativity that saved us and chose us and called us and justified us, it says that same creativity is being poured into good works prepared in advance for us to walk in. We are not saved by good works, but we are saved for good works. And if there's one thing that that is dynamite to conservatism is realizing that each one of us have good works prepared in advance for us to walk in. What was going on with Peter? Surely not, surely not, surely not. And as he's protesting, there's a knock on the door. And he goes, he concludes, oh my gosh, God has been at work. This is a holy heavenly conspiracy. That while I'm praying, there's an angel appearing to Cornelius. God is setting me up in the best way. And then as he goes, he hears Cornelius' story. And four days, he tracks back, four days ago, oh, I was praying four days ago. Oh my gosh, God, you've gone before me. You are the already previous God. If that doesn't make you and I get up in the morning saying, Lord, let me, let me cross the borderlines in my heart, in my street, in my social circle, in my town, in my region. Knowing that actually a saving God has, has handpicked people who He has prepared and ripened for us to come to. That's an amazing thing, isn't it? We're not twisting the hand of God to save people. Salvation belongs to the Lord. Land with the story. Studied a Zulu language, African language called Zulu and uh, English literature. Did a master's in education. My very first year, I was in this huge, big theater of 300 students. I'm just going, how do I walk out my faith at college, in this humanist college? How, how, how do I do that? And we used to have this little rule that if the lecturer was late, you had 10 minutes before, he, before students could go. And the lecturer was late. I was sitting up at the top in the bleachers, and it got to about six minutes. And I sensed the Holy Spirit say, I've got my hand on someone here, and you need to nail your colors to the mast in terms of belonging to me. You know when your heart begins to pulsate and your palms get all sweaty and I'm just going, now it's seven minutes. Now I've got three minutes to go and all these guys are ducking and oh, what do I do? So I make my way down to the bottom and I just say, look, I know you guys are going in two minutes now. but I want to say I'm a Christian. I believe there's someone here or some people here that need Jesus and he's Savior and he's Lord and you can't win his love. But actually, he died for you, and I'd like to pray for you if you'd like to receive Jesus. And it was 10 minutes, and everyone just flocked out. And there was one guy who st stayed behind, and he just said, I'm desperate. I'm depressed. Will you pray for me? And I led, led him to Christ that day. My friends, that's, that's not me naturally. But that was me with a growing sense of the already previous God having gone before. That is what will break us out of conservatism. That is what will have us packing our bags and opening our doors and opening our fridges and breaking out of our own social circles with people we prefer. And as we prayed for you as a church with the gospel to the nations, I got a very clear picture of a turnstile. You know, a turnstile that leads from one field to another. And I sense God saying to you as a church, radiant church, that 
You know, only one person can fit into a turnstile at a time. But that if you will respond and not say, here I am, send Fred, but here I am, send me, that actually the turnstile will start turning. And people will start going in their ones to regions beyond. To Sacramento, to Mexico, to Yugoslavia, to Bolivia. As, as effective doors open. And I'm not saying that you just shotgun. You walk with your, with your leaders. But, but the turnstile will start turning. And if you will be faithful in the turnstile, I believe God will turn it into a revolving door. And the revolving door can fit three, four, five people in a segment. But it requires that, that, that you and I are faithful when the voice of God comes and we don't say, surely not, Lord. And I sense, Travis, particularly for you, and this almost seems like the opposite word, Acts 19, when Peter had been at work in Corinth, and there'd actually been resistance, and Peter actually wanted to shake the dust of his feet and go. And, and, and in the night, the Lord appeared and said, no, no, stay, stay, because I have people in this city that are mine. And I, and I sense God saying, actually, you will not be the commissioned, you will be a commissioner. And God will give you weighted grace on this city because there are people that the already previous God has handpicked. Uh, stay, stay. But actually, other people will go. So if I can just pray for you as we land. Lord, we thank you for this, this stunning passage of the gospel crossing borderlines from Jew to Gentile. And, and, and Lord, we come to you with our pride and prejudice and we just say, Lord, we are so conservative. We, we, we like to be comfortable. We like to stick with those who are like us and those who like us. And, and we just confess that as sin. We confess it as favoritism. And we thank you that the gospel has broken down the dividing wall between us and people who are not like us. And I thank you for this picture that you didn't use someone who was just like Cornelius to win Cornelius to Christ. You used someone who was so different. And so we just say, here we are, Lord. Send us. Send us to our neighbors. Send us to our neighborhoods. Send us to our region. Send us to our state. Send us to our nation and in regions beyond. Uh, we, we pray that the, the turnstile in this church would start turning. And that as they are faithful, it would turn into a revolving door. For your sake and the sake of the nations. Amen. Thanks for listening. We want to be a resource for you as you walk with Jesus. So please connect with us at radiantvicelia.com. Until next time. I